Thanks. Well, I thought what I would do is tell you a few of my startup stories and uh, then talk about what I think I might have learned from uh, some of the things that I've done. So I'll try and, try and run through. I'm not sure if uh, all of my startup stories are transferable or relevant to situations that you all might find yourselves in, but I'll, I'll tell you what's happened with me. So I grew up in England, and uh, I was a kind of a precocious physics-type kid, so I started like writing physics papers when I was 14 and so on. And uh, then by the time I was 20, I had a PhD from Caltech in physics, and I was sort of on the track of becoming you know, an academic uh, uh, physics-type person. Well, I had also, uh, I'd always been a person who was interested in having the best tools for doing the things I wanted to do. And so actually starting in, uh, when I was pretty young, I started using computers because I wasn't very good at doing mathy kinds of calculational kinds of things that were pretty important for physics. And I thought, I'm not very good at doing this, but I think I can get a computer to do this stuff better than I can do it myself. So let me try and uh, uh, do that. And I got involved in building more and more elaborate tools for, for doing those kinds of things. There was a, a great tool actually was built at MIT called Maxima that, that uh, did all kinds of mathematical computation. I remember uh, 1979 talking to the folks who had developed Maxima and uh, I'd been, I think I'd become its biggest worldwide user by that time. And I was saying, I think something much better than Maxima can be done. Uh, you know, why don't you guys do it? And the older people who were working on the project were saying, well, it's the wrong time in our lives. We don't want to work on doing this. The younger people were saying, nothing better than this will ever be done. Well, I decided I didn't really believe that. So uh, I realized that if I actually wanted a, a really good tool for doing the kinds of work that I wanted to do in physics and other kinds of science, that I really had no choice but to build the thing myself. So uh, sometime in 1979, I I said, OK, I'm going to build a software system for doing mathematical computation. I'm going to use this newfangled language called C that people were starting to talk about at that time. Um, and I'm going to, going to build this thing. So at that time, I was kind of a professor type at, at Caltech. Um, and uh, I put together a sort of team of people, students, other kinds of people. And we started building the software system. Within a year or so, we had a thing that was called SMP that was starting to run. And uh, I thought uh, it was pretty useful. I thought it was going to be, you know, I built it to be useful to myself, but it was clear it was going to be useful to lots of other people too. And so then I was thinking, what am I going to do with this thing? You know, it was clear that uh, uh, I, uh, it, it wasn't something that could be sort of supported as a personal project if it was going to be used by lots of other people. So I said, okay, what's the thing to do with this? Well, I think the, uh, uh, the thing that I realized was, well, I was thinking, you know, maybe it could be sort of a public domain thing. People weren't talking about those kinds of things so much in those days. But I realized, look, it's, it's just, I, I tried to, first, my first idea was I would go to the Caltech technology transfer people and I would say, uh, you know, help me to do something useful with this in the world. So they set up a couple of meetings. They were kind of silly. Eventually, I said to the people there, why don't you know how to do this better? You know, you're a technical school, you know, it's et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the, sort of this one moment was the, the person who led that group saying to me, look, you have to understand, most of the time, professor types uh, just, they don't go through the, the school. They just go off and start companies themselves. And we don't really hear from them. We don't have to do anything with them. So I said, OK, can I do that? And then I said, you know, write me a letter that says that. And of course, that turned into a big mess. That's a different story. But uh, the, uh, the result of that was that I, I started my first company. And I was 21 years old or something. And my sort of self-image was that I was a kind of academic kid who didn't really know much about companies. And I really didn't know much about companies. Um, I, so I thought, what am I going to do in starting this company? So I looked around and I tried to find a CEO for the thing because I thought, actually, I had a, a student who was working with me who seemed like he'd be a promising person to really take on this company and then wanted to find a sort of more seasoned CEO. So my first big mistake was that I eventually hired a CEO who was twice my age. Um, and this was not, uh, you know, the problem with that was not, he was a good guy, sensible fellow, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he, uh, you know, the problem was the worldview of the, of the person twice my age was a bit different from my worldview, and there was a certain uh, kind of uh, mismatch there. But anyway, the company got started, uh, raised some angel money, then some venture capital, um, and uh, it, it, uh, I got kind of increasingly frustrated because I kept on saying, you know, I don't think it makes common sense sense to be doing the things we're doing from a business point of view. And the folks who I brought in were saying, you know, we have been doing business for ages and we think we know what we're doing. Anyway, I got, I got quite frustrated. Um, and uh, eventually I kind of peeled off from the whole thing. The company actually kept going 
and turned out the people I brought in were not very good at making money, but they were really good at raising money. And I think the, uh, uh, I actually think uh, they actually ran out of letters of the alphabet in series of financing for that company. And amazingly, in the mid-90s, um, I, you know, I get this big stack, I was still a large shareholder of this thing, I get this big stack of, uh, of documents, which I assume was going to be some bankruptcy filing, but actually it was an IPO prospectus thing, and so the company went public and hasn't done anything terribly exciting, um, and you know, got bought by a bigger fish and so on. Anyway, so that was my first startup uh, experience, was a, a fairly traditional startup in a sense, except that it was very early relative to modern times, and, and people hadn't, the idea that people at universities would go off and do startups was, was, very, was very new, and, and there was a lot of resistance to it, and a lot of people thought it was crazy, and so on. Um, and uh, I kind of, the main thing I learned from that was that I wasn't quite as dumb about business as I assumed that I would be. So then I, for a few years, I, I was an academic type, and... Um, uh, I had this hobby of kind of doing strategy consulting for companies, and so I, I learned from watching uh, other people's uh, uh, bizarre things going on in other people's companies. I kept on saying, well, this is interesting, but it was very frustrating because people wouldn't take my advice. I was, you know, it turned out usually my advice was correct, but they wouldn't take it, so that was very, very frustrating. So I said, okay, if I'm going to do this again, I am going to be, you know, fully in charge, in control of, of the company that I build because it's too frustrating otherwise. So then in the, in the mid-80s, um, I had, well, I had worked on a, a particular direction in science, and I had gone and um, started, uh, well, I actually had done a, a micro startup. I started a scientific journal, um, which is actually still going today, um, and uh, sort of my, my smallest startup ever. Um, and, uh, the, but, but then I, I um, uh, done a bunch of science. I was interested in building better tools to do the science, uh, uh, do more of the science, and so I, I uh, and it was at a time when, when PCs were just coming to the point where you could run sophisticated software on a PC-like uh, machine. So that got me started in building Mathematica. And again, my, my own objective was to build a, a system and a tool that I personally would find incredibly useful for the rest of my life. So that was kind of my theory is I'm building something for myself. Um, and this time around, I kind of knew what I was doing a little bit more. I said, I'm not going to get any outside investors. I, I, uh, you know, I ran up, I think my, my peak funding moment was uh, the $70,000 uh, uh, sort of um, American Express bill that um, uh, I had sort of uh, run up at some point. But we were, I, I knew a lot of people in the computer industry by that time, and we were able to make all sorts of deals up front uh, that were along the lines of if we build Mathematica, then uh, uh, people will license it, put it on various kinds of hardware. It was, a, it was bundled on the, on the next computer, which was Steve Jobs' machine between the Macintosh and the Macintosh, so to speak. Um, and uh, then, um, so that, that company, uh, I started um, in, well, in 1986, end of 1986. Um, and we started building Mathematica, um, and it was kind of one of these cases where I had built a similar kind of computer system, somewhat similar kind of computer system before, so at the beginning it was sort of, uh, people, people often say, you know, you do best things, you know, plan to, to throw one away, you know, plan to build something and then plan to do it right the next time. This was a case where, for various reasons, I actually got an opportunity to do that. Um, so, we built Mathematica, I started building a company, um, it, uh, it, we released Mathematica in 1988. Um, it's, uh, things started growing pretty rapidly, um, and uh, uh, I didn't bring in any investors or anything. We never needed to, uh, and we've had a profitable company for 22 years now. Um, and the company has sort of grown um, in a... Uh, 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 it's sort of steadily grown. It's been a private company. I thought in the early 1990s, I thought about taking the company public uh, you know, we had lots of nice growth, and I started talking to investment bankers and so on. And I was uh, kind of thinking, you know, uh, it was kind of interesting because even the people within the company, who in many cases would have stood to, to uh, uh, make a lot of money from, from that transaction, um, were kind of saying, look, we really like what we're doing, and, you know, if we, if we take the company public, then we're not really working for ourselves, so to speak. We're, you know, working for all these outside people. Let's not take on that kind of burden. Okay, so, so anyway, that was the... Uh, uh, so, we started with Mathematica sort of primarily in kind of mathematical, technical kinds of computation. Over the years, Mathematica has grown greatly, and we've sort of built a pretty efficient technical machine for, uh, for building out Mathematica. I'm not sure that people have quite yet in the world understood what Mathematica can do, 
but that's a separate issue and, and maybe not uh, the, 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 the sort of business and marketing aspects of our company may not be the, its, its, uh, its best part. It's primarily oriented towards R&D. I sort of hoped when I first built the company that we could make it a pure R&D company and that we could just set things up so that uh, all of the distribution of our product would be through uh, deals with other hardware companies and so on. And that was sort of plan A in terms of the setup of the company. Um, but it became clear in the first six months or so that, that uh, uh, these other folks, while they had good intentions, really didn't understand our product well enough to be the ones who were sort of uh, pushing it out to the market. Well, okay, so a few years into uh, uh, our company, well, from research and uh, the, the selling of Mathematica, um, I decided that um, I could spend 100% of my time working on this company and it would hopefully do X percent better where X was hopefully a positive number. But uh, I was interested in, in doing other kinds of things and so I thought I would take a, a six months to one year kind of pseudo sabbatical and go off and work on a bunch of basic science. Well, that my, my, timing wasn't, uh, uh, wasn't, my timing estimate wasn't very good and that six months or a year turned into ten and a half years. Um, working on uh, developing a, a new direction in science that has to do with kind of exploring the, the universe of all possible programs and, and so on. Well, I got that finally finished in 2002 and um, published this book called A New Kind of Science um, and uh, that, that has had all sorts of effects that I won't, won't talk about here. Um, but uh, then I kind of came back and, and uh, worked very hard on sort of re, re uh, sort of taking Mathematica to a new level within our company. Um, and then at uh, some point I realized this, the science that I built gives me a bunch of ideas for pieces of technology to build. So I thought, let me actually you know, take these a bit seriously. They were pieces of technology I didn't think were really possible. I, particularly, I'd been interested in the question of, you know, there's all this knowledge and data and so on in the world. Um, can one somehow wrap all this stuff up and make it computable so that uh, people can just kind of do the thing that uh, has been in science fiction for a long time of just sort of walk up to a, a computer and ask it a question and have it answer that question on the basis of the knowledge that our civilization has produced. Well, I thought for, you know, I, I've had these, these various ideas about uh, interesting pieces of technology that one might build, and one of the questions is to pick the right decade to try and actually do this, this project. And so this particular project I'd sort of thought about since I was a kid, and I'd always concluded it was the wrong decade to do it. But as a result of the science work that I'd done, and as a result of the things we built with Mathematica, I kind of realized about five or six years ago that maybe the time had actually come to try and build such a thing. So then we started building this thing that uh, uh, is now called Wolfram Alpha. Um, and uh, this was kind of set up as a, as a startup inside our kind of uh, long, quite stable company. Um, and at first it was a very, as usually is the case, you know, my other sort of senior management folk were saying, this is another one of your crazy projects, you know, it's not going to go anywhere. But I kind of persisted, and since it's my company, I get to do that. And it was, uh, uh, you know, my money that was getting spent on, on building this thing. Um, and again, uh, I sort of, I don't think anybody would have invested in it because they say, I want to make a, a system that can uh, uh, make all the world's knowledge computable. And, uh, you know, I wanted to act like uh, the sort of science fiction stuff people would have said, that's nuts, there's no way we'll invest in this. Um, and uh, so I just had myself to blame if the whole thing failed completely. Um, but anyway, a, a year and a half ago, we, we brought out Wolfram Alpha, and uh, we've been uh, uh, growing that business uh, uh, very nicely. So, so now the, the whole collection of, of companies that we have uh, is about, it's still fairly small, it's 650 people, um, and, uh, uh, it's, um, and it's now sort of the Wolfram Research is the main piece, then there's Wolfram Alpha, which is a couple hundred people, um, that's, but, which is growing rapidly. Um, so in terms of, um, so I've done a few other uh, startup y kinds of things, um, and then I'll talk about what I, what I might have learned and what might be useful to other people. Um, the, uh, uh, actually, the situation that we're in right now is that we've got a, you know, just a ridiculous excess of technology. We've got all this stuff that we've been able to build with Mathematica, this sort of big platform for doing sort of algorithmic software development and so on. We've got all the stuff we built with Wolfram Alpha, um, and now I've kind of realized there are probably half a dozen really good product slash company things that, uh, uh, that we should be doing. Um, our company is kind of, uh, uh, doesn't have enough business folk. It doesn't have enough people who are, uh, you know, who are interested in sort of building those businesses. So, yes, needless to say, I'm, 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 I'm recruiting, okay? So, um, but, uh, 
Uh, in any case, so I'm, I'm kind of, I'm about to learn how to do a bunch more startups. I'll mention one other little startup that uh, we did recently, which was um, a, uh, a thing called Touch Press. So I'll tell you the story behind this. Um, when uh, one of the people who's been, uh, uh, worked at my company for 23 years now, this chap called Theo Gray, and at some point he, he's run the user interface development effort for Mathematica, and at one point about a decade ago, he didn't have quite enough work to do, I think. And so he started this hobby of uh, collecting samples of chemical elements and putting them in a wooden periodic table table, which is a, a nice tourist attraction at our office space. But um, uh, anyway, he did this, and uh, he sort of turned this thing into writing a uh, you know, column for Popular Science magazine and things like that, and then made a book of, of pictures of his, his chemical element thing. And then, then, uh, you know, then the iPad started to uh, appear, and then uh, we realized um, that uh, he could make a really nifty iPad ebook based on uh, these chemical element pictures and samples and so on that he had. Um, and so when, um, uh, right around April, when the iPad was coming out, we'd done a bunch of development of this uh, iPad ebook, and I said, look, you know, people are going to be interested in this. You know, nobody else is going to make an ebook that's as elaborate as this. People are going to be interested. We have to have an actual company wrapped around this so that, uh, so that when all these publishing companies and other people with digital assets uh, uh, come looking for, you know, who can they work with to, uh, uh, to actually make iPad ebooks, you know, we have a shingle out there. So in a matter of a, a couple of days, actually, we put together this company, which uh, is called Touch Press. We put out... Um, uh, and we, we put out this uh, iPad ebook when, when, the, when the iPad came out. It's, uh, it's been, I think it gets more airtime than anything else in the, in the iPad TV commercials right now. So that's, that's nice. And it's a, it's a good example of, a, of an iPad ebook, perhaps probably the best example of an iPad ebook right now. And actually, the sales of this, this book on chemical elements just crossed a million dollars um, uh, recently, which I think isn't bad for a book on chemical elements. Um, the, uh, it's a good book, though. It's kind of, kind of fun to read. Um, but uh, anyway, so, so that company is now, um, we brought in a, a person who had been involved with actually uh, sort of a chemical element side business for a while, is a chap who was a former BBC documentary maker, uh, brought him in to CEO that company, and now that's a little company with about, I think about a dozen employees right now, uh, and we have a, it's kind of funny to say I have a publishing company, and say, well, what books do you publish? And say, we published one book. Um, <laughs> But uh, we have another 10 or so that are, that are in, in the works. Um, so OK, that, that's some stories of my, uh, my startup adventures. So uh, you know, I've watched a lot of other people try and uh, do startups and so on. Um, you know, what, what have I noticed from all of this? And I've, I've been involved in, in counseling God knows how many uh, CEOs, usually sort of friends of mine who are doing, doing companies and so on. Uh, you know, one thing I've often wondered, because I'm a sort of people-oriented person and I've been involved in hiring lots and lots of people for our company, um, I sort of wonder, how do you tell whether somebody is going to be a good startup person, a good entrepreneur, a good internal entrepreneur within a, an existing company, a good external entrepreneur who's going to do their own thing completely separately? And I've, uh, you know, it's funny because over the years, you know, I think I've, I've sort of seen lots of people who've succeeded and failed. Um, and I've tried to, you know, figure out what's, what are the common themes. I think a very wide range of personalities can be successful entrepreneurs. Um, and I don't think there's a sort of unique, you know, personality test thing that shows you whether you're going to succeed. I think there's a certain tenacity, a certain stick with itness that's necessary. Um, I think, you know, sometimes I'll talk to entrepreneurs and they'll be very intellectual and philosophical. Sometimes they'll be very hustly and uh, kind of uh, whatever. Um, it doesn't, you know, both of these things seem to work. Um, I think that there needs to be a certain degree of pragmatism. I mean, if you say, I have this great idea, but you'll never, you never kind of come down to earth and actually think about, well, who's going to buy this thing? You know, how many, you know, can we actually uh, make the business practically run? Um, you know, that's a problem. But um, I've noticed, I mean, another thing is people who just sort of, uh, you know, occasionally people will come and they'll say, we have this get-rich-quick scheme. You know, it's a, we've just got this idea, there's this niche, it's a fantastic thing, you know, it's just going to work, it's, everybody's going to get rich quick. I, I think I can, it's fair to say I've never seen that work. I mean, usually, you know, it takes hard work, 
Um, it, you know, usually you read these stories about how somebody just sort of happened to drop into some fantastic idea and some fantastic thing. Then when you know the people, you realize, well, actually, they had this long history and they had a you know, whole elaborate build-up. You know, they had, uh, they'd seen you know, in their family or something, they'd, they'd had companies for three generations and they'd seen how those worked and so on. And they kind of had a lot of ambient knowledge and it wasn't just one of these things where by chance they happened to, uh, to, to do the right thing. So I think it, it's... it's um, uh, you know, I've noticed also with people in general that uh, people at different stages in their lives have different sort of characteristics like, you know, the average time span of a project that they can do. So, you know, there are people where they do great on a two-hour project, and there are other people, uh, like myself probably, who do best on a kind of a, a six-month to two-year to, to more kind of project. And, you know, the people who do great on those longer projects, when they start a project, they say, we need all this kind of structure, we need to set up all these things to do this project. You know, it needs to be, uh, you know, because they're used to doing bigger projects and they know if you don't set these things up right, um, then, uh, then it all gets broken. And then there are other people at the other end where they kind of lose interest after a few hours. So then you have to kind of figure out in that spectrum, if you know where you are at a particular time, you can kind of decide what you should be doing. You know, if it's a two-hour type thing, then you should be doing something like technical support or some other area where it's kind of a quick response type of thing. I think for, uh, uh, you know, if you're, if you're on that end, you're probably not at the right stage of life to be doing a startup because those don't get done in two hours. Um, the, uh, I think, um, uh, you know, other things that I've, I've noticed, you know, people wonder, you know, what do you, I think, I think one thing that I've noticed is people who've been involved in or been sort of around some success that happened, something that went from nothing to something, there's a certain empowerment that uh, people get from having been close to the process of things going from nothing to something that kind of, I think it lasts about a decade. After somebody's been involved in something like that, they have a certain degree of confidence um, that is really helpful in terms of deciding to sort of jump in and, uh, and build something. I mean, I think, for example, in, in uh, uh, my own case, uh, something like Wolfram Alpha, it's a crazy project. I mean, you have to be a really arrogant, crazy person to decide to do a project like this. Um, and so this is, uh, you know, it was necessary to develop a certain degree of arrogance uh, to be able to, to do such a project. Well, it looks like I'm almost running out of time. I think it'd be much more interesting to try and uh, answer uh, things that people ask here. So rather than, rather than uh, trying to come up with the, the great pithy three things that you have to do in order to make a successful startup, why don't I turn it over to, to questions that people might have? Thanks. Um, one of the themes earlier this morning was the difference between suits and uh, engineers. And in the, some of the startups you've done, clearly you're more of a science engineer kind of person. Um, did you ever have to partner with a sales kind of breed of person, or were you able to do it all yourself? You know, I probably should have done partner with some more kind of salesy, businessy kinds of people, but I haven't. Um, and, uh, you know, my very first company, the person I brought in as CEO was more of a suit type person. And I think that that piece of adult trauma kind of uh, made me not do that again. Um, I think that uh, uh, it's difficult. I mean, for example, uh, uh, we have now in, in the Wolfram Alpha business, I brought in a bunch of, well, I don't think they wear suits because they're based in Palo Alto, but, but um, uh, they, you know, more of suit-like uh, people. Um, and it, it's sort of interesting to watch the, the interface between, between that group and the existing group. We, we now have a big enough company that we have a pretty fixed main corporate culture. And so, you know, these things sort of on the side don't, uh, don't have a big effect on that. But, you know, in, in a perfect world, I would have found the perfect business partner for myself and I would have just, you know, got on with them for, for 30 years, you know, working on a series of, of things together. But I didn't. And... Uh, uh, you know, I was able to, uh, to sort of make stuff. I, there's always this question of, do you say, do you do things the way everybody else does them or do you try and invent it for yourself? Um, I, I'm definitely much more along the lines of, I invent it for myself. Um, sometimes I feel kind of stupid a few years later because I say it really would have been much better to just do it the conventional way and just hire somebody who already knew how to do this. Um, but often I don't fall into traps that, uh, you know, everybody else is chasing this particular fad and, and we don't. Um, but yeah, it, it's a, it's a, um, I, I've definitely, you know, I myself am more motivated by the kind of intellectual side of things, but I'm sort of practical enough to be, and I'm, I'm interested in people, and I'm sort of interested in strategies for things, so that's kind of gotten me through, um, and I, I think we're, we're not a very, um, 
I do own a suit. I noticed that recently. I do own a suit. I haven't used it very often. Um, please. Thank you for your talk. Um, could you talk a little bit more about Wolfram Alpha, uh, maybe a little more about how you collect and aggregate the data and uh, whether you feel that it's as successful as you envisioned it to be, and functionality-wise, not, not so much usage-wise. I'll, I'll keep this fairly short, because I could go and talk about this you know, endlessly, and I, I want to mostly talk about you know, the, the meta questions of, of uh, company startups and so on. Uh, I mean, the, the, you know, Wolfram Alpha is a big, complicated project. It is by far the most complex project I've ever done. Many, you know, lots of different moving parts, lots of different kinds of expertise needed. I mean, it's got basically four pieces. It has to sort of pull in the data of the world, and so we're kind of going to primary data sources. We've got this whole data curation pipeline that we've built. Um, we're sort of, we just actually had last couple of days in Washington, D.C., our first data summit where we kind of invited the leaders of sort of the world's great data repositories, which are basically the sources that we use, and had a, a terrific time uh, meeting with all those folk. But anyway, there's sort of bringing the data in. Uh, then there's uh, sort of uh, once you have sort of the raw data all nicely cleaned up, there's how do you actually compute useful things? Uh, from it, and that's a question of sort of accumulating all the sort of algorithms and methods and so on that have come up from science and financial analysis and whatever else. And uh, you know, the result of doing that is 10 million lines of Mathematica code. Um, then there's uh, okay from that. How do you have humans actually interact with this thing? Uh, well, you have to have uh, uh, the the only way to deal with a system this big is to have humans use something they already know, like human language. And so you have to be able to understand all these weird linguistic utterances that people type into an input field. And so that's been, uh, that's been another big thing that I thought might be completely impossible uh, to have something that, that uh, really by now we, about 93% of inputs uh, produce a, a useful result first time around. Um, and that's uh, partly that's a bunch of sort of science-based breakthroughs actually that came from this new kind of science direction that I built. Um, and then, you know, after that, you have to worry about, uh, you know, how do you get a bunch of colos and machines and, you know, consistently running systems. And, you know, now we have good enough software engineering that we're able to push the, a new version of the code base once a week um, out to the, to the production servers and so on, which I think is a good achievement. In terms of, uh, uh, you know, things, I think the main thing that we've learned from the last year and a half, I mean, I expect this to be a very long-term project. This is the kind of thing I like to do is these, uh, you know, I myself like to do very long-term projects which will just build over the course of years to decades and so on. This is a long-term project. It's, it's going really well. It's scaling up very nicely. Um, what we're doing, you know, the, the, the thing people first saw is the WolframAlpha.com website. Uh, that's really just the tip of a large iceberg of sort of knowledge-based computing where one's able to start from this, this thing that already knows a lot of stuff and be able to immediately compute things from it. Um, and so that we brought out these uh, Wolfram Alpha widgets a few weeks ago where you can uh, just make a little calculator-like widget in under a minute, actually. You can make with a sort of form builder thing, you can make this widget, but then underneath it is Wolfram Alpha, which computes all this stuff. Then you can stick that widget in a, you know, in a, in a website or a, you know, a, a social media app or something like this. Um, then we've got uh, lots of other things, lots of other partnerships with, uh, like with Bing, search engine partnership and so on, uh, where we're sort of taking this uh, computable knowledge and deploying it in, in different places. Um, and there's lots of other things, but let me, not, let me not talk about that here. Do you find yourself using it on, a, uh, on any regular basis? Of course I do. Otherwise I wouldn't, you know, and, and I'm, uh, I don't know whether, it's the, the only question is, am I the biggest reporter of bugs or, or not? <laughs> um, and I think, uh, I'm, uh, I'd have to check that. I'm, I'm probably the, 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 the world's top reporter of bugs in Wolfram Alpha. Um, Yes. I'd like to apologize for a second non-startup question, but um, on a, in a recent interview about what, how you use your computer, you talked about um, how what you would really like for the future of computing is easy recording, transcription, archiving, and searching of everything, basically. Um, and there are, there are rumors of you having like this crazy awesome conversation archive system. Um, and I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more about how you use your computer oh, to keep track of your life. <laughs> Oh, I'm just, look, I'm just a, I'm a data nut, okay? So for the last 25 years or so, I've collected everything I can about, uh, uh, about sort of things I do, like I record every keystroke that I type on a computer, and I, you know, record all this other stuff, and I have all, all sorts of sensors and things, and every so often I go and actually look at these things and sort of do the personal analytics and try and learn what I can about myself from sort of observing myself. And uh, actually, I think I'm, a, I'm about ready for another round of doing that. I just, got, I just got another piece of data. I just got my whole genome. 
um, that which is uh, um, it's actually came on a, a one terabyte uh, disk drive. Um, and uh, so now you know, I can display my whole genome and I have somebody starting to dig through it and, and find out if I can learn anything useful about myself from it. Um, but uh, uh, this is uh, you know, what, what I found. I mean, I'm sure this will be a big thing in the future, this kind of area of personal analytics, because it's very easy to record all this stuff. And then you, know, you can learn things like you know, one terrible thing to learn is if I look at my email stream, uh, the, uh, if, if, I, if I look at who I'm sending email to, um, and uh, if, the, if the email that I'm sending to, for example, an internal person within the company has gone down, um, that's typically a six-month leading indicator of that person failing. So, you know, and I, that, that's a, uh, uh, one can wonder why that happens. You know, that's a sort of a science question. Why does, this, why does it happen that way? But, but the, the, you know, there, there are many kinds of things. That, like, for example, I've tried to optimize. I get, these days I get about 500 emails per day, and I try to optimize uh, sort of when during the day I try and process these and, you know, how, how it all works. And I've done that by just looking at the data about, uh, you know, how I operate. But this is, this is going to be a bigger thing in the future, and, and maybe we'll actually build some products around, around this, because one of the things that, you know, with Wolfram Alpha, um, you start to be able to ask lots of kind of practical questions about, uh, about the world and how you might do things and so on, and if you link that with this kind of personal analytics stuff, uh, you get to sort of uh, make a, to, to automate lots of kind of personal assistanting functions in a way that I think is quite useful. Yes. Cool, thanks. Are you involved in a mathematical demonstration project? Uh, it would be uh, very useful to make some of those notebooks exportable as executable Java. It would make it easier to include in some web pages. Uh, oh, you, so, so I mean, the, okay, a, a little technology thing. I mean, in, um, uh, uh, yeah, because, uh, in with Mathematica, for example, one of the things we have this demonstrations project which yeah. produces all these nice yeah, uh, I wrote one of those, uh, and, and some people uh, wanted to include it into the web page. I, I uh, understand, I understand. I'm, yeah. I'm going to address I, this. Yeah. The, so, <laughs> okay. so the, I mean, uh, this is actually a startup that we are in the process of doing that's probably going to be called, that's a thing called CDF, Computable Document Format. And kind of the idea is, uh, well, we have all of these, um, uh, let's see if I can pick one up. Um, I have no idea what this one is, but let's just try and pick it up here. Um, and uh, uh, what will happen here, um, this is well, it's probably starting up some, something, who knows. Um, oh, there we go. Okay. So this is just sitting inside a web page. You can actually embed it however you want. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, this will do all, all its thing. This is, this is just a, uh, this is a CDF plugin running on the, the web. And kind of the idea is to take, this is one of these cases, we have all this technology we built for 20 years, this kind of uh, whole language for describing uh, sort of dynamic interactive computation. And now it's a question of sort of packaging it so that you can deploy it on, uh, on websites, mobile devices, all this kind of thing. And that's, that's one of the various startups that we're in the process of figuring out how to do. Um, so the, the answer, I think, is that we have a really good solution for, for what I think you said you wanted to do. Yes? I think we're going to have to break. Oh, OK. There's a flash in the red light. Thanks. So we're going to. Thanks. Well, I thought what I would do is tell you a few of my startup stories and uh, then talk about what I think I might have learned from uh, some of the things that I've done. 
So I'll try and, try and run through. I'm not sure if uh, all of my startup stories are transferable or relevant to situations that you all might find yourselves in, but I'll, I'll tell you what's happened with me. So I grew up in England, and uh, I was a kind of a precocious physics-type kid, so I started like writing physics papers when I was 14 and so on. And uh, then by the time I was 20, I had a PhD from Caltech in physics, and I was sort of on the track of becoming you know, an academic uh, uh, physics-type person. Well, I had also, uh, I'd always been a person who was interested in having the best tools for doing the things I wanted to do. And so actually starting in, uh, when I was pretty young, I started using computers because I wasn't very good at doing mathy kinds of calculational kinds of things that were pretty important for physics. And I thought, I'm not very good at doing this, but I think I can get a computer to do this stuff better than I can do it myself. So let me try and uh, uh, do that. And I got involved.